Welcome readers to Shelf Help. Thank you for joining me as we continue our journey through the world of Blood and Ash. Let's start with what we know. Someone dug up the ancient star for purposes unknown. Collis falls in love with Satoria and she falls off cliff. Collis used the star to change places with Ethos. Collis brings back Satoria, but she dies again. Prophecy comes down from the sleeping ancients. Kalos murders Ethos' wife while she's pregnant, but Nyctoth lives. Ethos consults the fates. Ethos makes the deal for the first daughter of the Muriel bloodline. So let's get into the books, starting with A Shadow in the Ember. Our main girl for this series is Serafina. I had been groomed within an inch of my life after the bath hair plucked and waxed from all manner of places. The gown, if it could be called such, had been constructed of sheer chiffon and little else. I hated the dress, the bath, and the grooming that had come after that, even though I understood its purpose. I was to entice, seduce. She's 17 here, by the way. Considering my other series, chapter by chapter, I feel like I can't not draw the parallel between Serafina and Isla. Both were raised in very isolated circumstances to seduce and kill. The results are very different. For one, Sierra's upbringing isn't fundamentally silly. Where Isla was imprisoned in a greenhouse for reasons that are rather questionable at best, Sira moves through life like a ghost. She's surrounded by people who are for forbidden to even acknowledge she exists, must cover most of her face with a veil so no one can look at her, and is not allowed to speak or touch anyone. Her life is purity culture on steroids, and it has left her with terrible anxiety. Even her personality has become muted, made malleable, so she can become whatever she needs to be for the purposes of seduction. The whole of her person is sacrificed for a kingdom that doesn't even know she exists or why. And there's no magic get out of jail free star stick. Syria is lonely and sympathetic. She's the tragedy of being alive without living. Isla, by contrast, breezes along as if ticking the tragic backstory box was all that was needed to get the sympathy points. But enough about that. The real contrast here is between Serafina and Poppy. Poppy's maiden attire is described as a white dress covering her from chin to toes with long sleeves that cover her hands, hair twisted up under a veil that covers everything but the lower half of her face. Serafina's yeah. dress is, well, it's like one of those Halloween costumes that tacks on, but make it slutty. Of course, Siri is about to be the sacrificial child bride of death, and Poppy was being kept, quote, pure, unquote, for, well, honestly, kind of the same thing, with a distinction and a difference. But there is a very purposeful parallel between Poppy's story and Serafina's, which thankfully is used with a light touch. While interesting as a literary device, no one needs a full retread of the previous book. The next point of interest is found a few paragraphs down. The price that had been promised 200 years before I was born. This is our first reference to the deal. I wonder who intervened to make sure a single family went 200 years without any girls. That's what, eight generations, give or take? Of course, Nick Toss needed time to grow into his primal powers. I kind of wonder if the fates nudged the odds. I thought of the mortal Satoria, whom the steep bluffs had been named after. Legend claimed that she had been picking flowers along the cliff and fell to her death after being frightened by a god. And there's our first Satoria mention, as well as the cliffs and her death. The connection between Satoria, Serafina, Poppy, and Kalos is the thread that ties the whole story together. 
As I said in my introduction to this series, while it hasn't been confirmed at the time of this writing, and probably won't be until Primal of Blood and Bone comes out, Hoppy is more than likely the reborn Satoria. Her journey from mortal to Primal Plus was a messy one. I'd like to make a prediction here. Satoria jumped. The only account we have of events comes from Kallus, who, as we will see, is not a reliable narrator. Sir Holland wasn't here. I would have liked to say goodbye to him, even though I didn't expect him to be here. His presence would raise too many questions among the Shadow Priests, would reveal too much. Oh, Holland. This is the shit I live for in rereads. Knowing he's one of the Ari, the Fates, throws everything he does and doesn't do into new light. The Ari are the ancients who didn't go to sleep. Holland is the single most powerful being in the mortal realm at this moment. He might not be able to predict the future, but he can make some damn good educated guesses. It makes the places he chooses not to be just as interesting as when he decides to show up. Having a fate just hanging out at the Shadow Temple when Nick Toss arrives to pick up his promised consort is going to raise a lot of questions, but none that Sierra is working about. There was no way he could know that in the 200 years it had taken for me to be born, the knowledge of how to kill a primal had been obtained. Love. They had one fatal weakness that made them vulnerable enough to be killed, and that was love. Make him fall in love, become his weakness, and end him. That was my destiny. Okay, we're gonna put a big old shiny pin in that one. It's a big one and cuts through the whole prequel. And Holland just rolled with it and said not a word here. He knows the truth, and he didn't say a damn thing. Of course, the thing with the Arya is they have two tasks. First is to keep the balance, and second, to not interfere. This is why I say they are a who watches the watcher situation. They can't do both at the same time. But who gets to say what interference is? You can't observe something without affecting it. You can't teach the double-souled mortal vessel of the embers of life how to fight, be her guard, and give her advice, and not have an effect on the choices she makes. In addition, they only answer to the true primal of light. Ethos is dead, and Syria hasn't come into her power yet. Kallus can do nothing to stop them, which must really piss him off. Also, pivoting back to Lightlark for a minute, this is why execution is important. This is almost the same goddamn plot setup. Yes, I'm just realizing it. Yes, I find it a wee bit unsettling. I wasn't even sure I breathed as I looked into the void where his face should be. The primal of death shifted closer, and one of the shadow tendrils brushed across the bare skin of my arm. I gasped at its icy feel. He lowered his head, and every muscle in my body seized. I wasn't sure if it was his presence or the innate instinct we all had that warned us not to run, not to make sudden movements in the presence of a predator. You, he said, his voice smoked and shadow and full of everything that awaited after someone took their very last breath. I have no need for a consort. On its face, it's very easy to assume the simple solution is for Nyctos to suck it up, just take the embers, become primal of life, and kick Kallus in the teeth. Surely that's what Ethos intended. Is it though? The prophecy came down between when Kalos took the Embers of Life and Ethos made the deal, and we know Ethos consulted the fates. The problem isn't just that there is no true primal of life, it's that there are two primals of death. Even if Nyctos took the Embers of from Syrah, he wouldn't stop being a primal of death, 
just like Kallus did not stop being the true primal of death. Thus, death would still outnumber life two to one. There's also the problem that the primal embers come with anti-piracy software. There are only two for sure ways to become a primal. One must either be born with primal embers, or they must be ascended to primal by the true primal of life. Even though some of the embers in Syria's blood originally belonged to Nyctos, there's no guarantee they would accept him back. And even if they did, not only there's still two primals of death, but we're back to Ethos's dilemma. And with the first and last of the Muriel bloodline dead, there would be no second daughter to become blood and bone, a primal powerful enough to kill Kallus. Could a new deal be struck, or are the embers of life now irreparably tied to the daughters of a single bloodline? That seems like a pretty shaky basket to toss the fate of the world in. Moving on to the story proper. At this point, the story hums along for a while, building on the world and Sira herself, before we get to the next important overarching point. Sira meets Ash for the first time. Well, second time. But this without the context of him being the primal of death. Why yes, I am going to accept this convention of the genre without comment or question. I don't question the tech in science fiction, the magic in fantasy, or the meat cute in romance. I will not try to order a milkshake at a Home Depot. What is fun here is that we get a mirror scene for the time Castile caught Poppy on the wall during the Craven attack. Though this time they're hiding from murderous baby killing gods. And we get our next Satoria reference. The contact of my mouth against his caused my stomach to pitch like it did when I came too close to the edges of the Cliffs of Sorrow. Serafina was born with more than one soul. Though, she doesn't know this yet. Along with the Embers of Life, Satoria's soul was placed in Serafina's bloodline, to be born with the first daughter of that bloodline. And we learned that while Satoria can't really communicate, she is conscious on some level. It's not a stretch here to say that what Sira's feeling near the cliffs may not be her own. I lifted a finger to my still throbbing lip then withdrew it and looked down at the spot of darkness at the tip of my finger. He'd drawn blood. My head snapped up. You! The god stepped in, folding his hand around my wrist. He lifted my arm, and before I could wonder what he was about, his mouth closed over my finger, and he sucked. It's vampire romance. Blood is important. But this does give Nyctos the ability to feel when Seraph is experiencing deep emotions, which lead to several of my favorite scenes in the series. Yes, I'm going to gush a bit. On page 52, Holland is training Sira. Again, I love Holland in the reread. His little quips about knowing things amuse the fuck out of me. And his prediction about Octavius one day being faster than Sira and causing her harm is a nice touch. But more to the point, this is the only kind of scene the fate and the future true primal of life and queen of the gods have with just the two of them, and it focuses on a highly specific skill with limited utility, throwing a dagger while blindfolded and hitting the heart. On first reading, this scene is rather banal. If you're coming off the main series, it's easy to assume Holland is another victor, like Poppy had. If you picked up this book first, you might just assume he's an older guard with wisdom to impart to his young charge. Either way, upon reread, it takes on a new light. The fates see possibilities and probabilities. See Holland's prediction about Tavius. So why is he teaching Sira this highly situational skill? We can assume there's a high probability she will need it. This isn't just about her hitting the target. She hits the chest but misses the heart. Incidentally, 
Most primals can only be killed by piercing heart or brain with shadow stone. Remember that pen about love weakening a primal? The key word there is most. The true primals of life and death are exempt. Killing one of them without a place for the embers to go would throw the world into chaos. So long as they, are, they have a single ember, they are immortal in the true sense of the word. Ancient bones will only temporarily inconvenience them. Putting two pins in that one. So even though someone let slip how to kill a primal, we'll get back to him later. This skill does not apply to Sira's goal. If the primal is weakened by his love for her, she doesn't need to throw a dagger. She'd have easy point-blank access. Also, as things stand, Hala knows that killing Ash won't help anything, and killing Kallus is impossible. As I said in my opening video, my main thesis is that the Fates are playing the long game to build a new ancient through Poppy. Step one in that plan has to be don't lose the embers of life. Putting in a new true primal of life will cause a war. Hell, there's gonna be a whole fourth book about it and not solve the problem. Collis murdered his brother for power. He will not bow to an ascended mortal. And as the proverb goes, when elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. I'm willing to bet that in Born of Blood and Ash, Sierra is going to have to make this throw to the heart to put Collis in the ground to set up for the main series. The scene is also our first mention that Sierra carries the embers of life in her. And Sierra thinks about the deal made promising her to death and how she failed and what it means for her kingdom and her people. I don't think it's ever addressed exactly what the royal family knows about the deal. They know the first daughter was promised as a consort for death, but so far only Holland has brought up the subject of the embers. It's possible they don't know the extent of what Ethos did, and most certainly don't know why he did it. Skipping forward, Sira encounters another victim of the murderous gods. She still doesn't know what they're up to. Ash sneaks up behind her and she reacts on instinct to stab him in the almost heart with her shadow stone dagger. Because the heart stabbing is foreplay in this series. But like Castile, Nick Toss got better. And then the dead woman gets up as a craven. Craven are what mortals become when their blood is drained and not replaced. They're functionally zombies. Fast zombies. Even Nyktos has never seen a craven, which is interesting. Also, this is the kind of banter I love. She stabs him, he destroys her dagger. Surprise, first ever craven in the mortal world. She points out how she would really like to have a dagger right now. Mortal danger, what's that? Next day, she's training with Holland again for blindfolded dagger throwing. This feels like it's leading to a rule of three. And because seeing the dead come back to life is a bit disturbing, she asks Holland about it, framing it as she heard about it while she was out. His brow lifted. I've never heard anything like that. If whoever said it was speaking truth, that sounds like an abomination. It's a coin flip if the fate in disguise is actually surprised here. The pause makes me think he knows what she's talking about, but is concerned there's a craven in the mortal world. But we don't get any more here, because Sira's stepsister comes to abscond her off to do a murder. I mean, rescue an abused child. Later, covered in blood because she definitely did not intend to murder the child abusing bastard, it just happened that way. Again. When he slipped. And slit his throat. On the knife she was holding. It happens. Anyway, she goes to clean up after swimming her lake. A lake made from one of the largest shadow stone deposits in the mortal world. 
where lo and behold, she meets Ash, yet again. She accuses him of being a creeper and threatens to stab him. We're just gonna skip past how often the women threaten to penetrate the men in this series. They are attacked by hunters, a type of gyrim, who are mortals that agreed to serve the gods instead of passing through the pillars. Two important notes here. One, Ash says that other gods and primals can sense when he's in the mortal realm and want to know what he's up to. But Holland has been hanging out in the same castle for 20-ish years unnoticed. Just worth noting that the fates can move unseen through the world, even by primals. The second is that Sira notes the gyrums smell like, like stale lilacs. Depending on their color, lilacs can symbolize different things. White is purity and innocence, purple is spirituality, and blue is tranquility. Which totally embodies Seraphita and Poppy. Very pure, very tranquil, not the least bit stab happy. Lilacs in this series are symbols of life, just as ash is used as a synonym for death. Stale lilacs are false or corrupted life putting up a counter for each of these. Sira notes that, notes in a following scene that the rot that is taking over the land also smells like stale lilacs. The rot is, well, fungus, living decay. It's not clear if Collis could ever create life beyond his initial burst, but by the time the story picks up, he clearly cannot and has not been able to for a while. The rot, like the gyrims, are death masquerading as life. It grows, it feeds, and it kills, but it can never propagate. All that's left in its wake is ash. Sira and her stepbrother Tavius butt heads. She treats him like the royal pain in the ass that he is, and he throws a bowl at her. Shortly after, someone pays some guards to bait her into a trap. She has to do her first practical blind dagger throw, and she misses. I had been wrong about how many were in the room. There were three, and they were all young. Well, probably only two in a few seconds. Sir Holland would be disappointed. My aim hadn't been spot on. The knife had caught the guard in the throat. This is followed by another detail that's easy to miss if you don't know to look for it. I'd never seen him before. I'd never seen anything like him before. He was tall and golden all over. His mane of hair, his skin, the elaborate facial paint, a shimmery gold sweep over his brows and down his cheeks, a design that resembled wings. But his eyes, they were such a pale shade of blue they nearly blended into the faint aura of ether behind the pupils. I knew then that he was a god, but it wasn't what left me unsettled. The facial paint reminded me of the charred skin on the seamstress's face. All primals can turn into an animal form. For Collis, that form is an eagle, and he's such a raging narcissist it makes all his followers paint gold fucking wings on their fucking faces. Now maybe one of Kylos's guards meeting with the queen before the right is a perfectly normal thing. He is the primal of life as far as the mortal world knows. But this god is dressed as a guard. Which implies a level of covertness is at play. And yet, and yet, the wildly obvious face paint. Collis really is the true rival of inferiority complexes. The god, by the way, is Callum, who isn't a god. Callum is Satoria's brother. We'll cover that history when we get there. Prediction? Callum is in love with Kalas and has been offing his sister's incarnations. For now, he is the recipient of my worst sibling award. Which, considering what Tavius is about to pull, is saying something. Personally, I look forward to his inevitable and messy death at the hands of Castile. 
We get our next Satori account when Holland brings here a tea to ease her culling symptoms. This is the first time in the series we hear more about Satoria than her header off a cliff. Her early death may or may not have been a tragic accident, but being ripped from the veil was not. While he doesn't name and shame Kalas here, because saying, this is the bad guy, probably crosses the dubious non-interference line, Holland does express how he feels about the tragedy of Satoria. Satoria rose and wasn't grateful for such an act. She was frightened and unhappy. The one responsible couldn't understand why she was so morose. Nothing he did made her better or made her love him. No one knows exactly how long Satoria lived her second life, but she ended up dying. Some say she purposefully starved to death. Others say she began to live again, to fight against her captor despite how powerful he was. She was the kind of warrior who fought back through the grief of losing her life at such a young age, through the loss of peace and control. No matter how badly the odds were stacked against her, that is why you remind me of her. Oh, she definitely fought back. Ain't no way the soul that leads to Poppy is gonna fade quietly into that good night. Our girl may not be able to take a primal yet, but she's gonna make him bleed for every step regardless. When Poppy beats Nick Toss, he mentions to himself how very alike she and Sierra are. It's not confirmed yet if they know Poppy is Satoria, but I suspect they do. Of course, from a literary standpoint, Satoria, Poppy, and Sira are reflections of each other by design, innocence interrupted, and the reclaiming of power. The mortal who fought a primal, the mortal who became a primal, and the mortal born goddess who will bring death to his knees. It's a long way to go. But when your stalker is literally death, I guess you have to go the extra mile. Our next important milestone is when Sira brings Marisol, her sister's future consort, back from the dead. Holland later says that this was just an accident. But we're down to the last six months of Sira's life and the expiration date on the embers she carries. The fates have a vested interest in those embers not going out. If there were a high probability that one man getting drunk would set off a chain of events leading to Ash getting his shit together and picking up his bride, they aren't forcing him to drink just by filling his glass. I'm just saying that Sira would has been warned all her life about not using her gifts, that she shouldn't play at being primal. There's only one person she would do anything for. Ezra is the only person who has been kind to her and treated her like a person. And Holland seemed very sure about what Tavius would do. It just strikes me as terribly convenient. This brings us to one of my favorite scenes in the series. The king is dead and the bastard ascends. Sira and Tavius echo the folly of Ethos and Kalos. Like Ethos, Sira failed to see what truly motivated her brother and how far he would go for the sake of his pride. Despite the fact she was the legitimate heir, her claim to the throne would be unsupported even by her mother. But the fact that she could make a claim at all would undermine Tavius' reign, especially with the rot. Tavius, like Collis, loves the trappings of being king, but he has little interest in the responsibility. This is also where Holland's prediction that Tavius would one day be faster comes to pass. Also, he fucks off and doesn't help because he knows Ash will. I guess this is a non-interference point. There really isn't any foreshadowing in these chapters. Tavius attacks Sira and whips her. Ash tears open the realms to claim his bride. People are turned to dust, throats are ripped open, and blood is spit back into mouths. And Sira feeds Tavius his own whip. Also, Ash refers to Sira as a cave cat. Mostly, this is a 
deeply cathartic scene where terrible people get what is coming to them. The fact that I deeply enjoy reading about people being turned to ash or dismembered in acts of pure vengeance probably means there's something wrong with me. But now we leave the mortal realm behind. Please join me next time on a Upon Reread as we venture into the Shadowlands, a place of gods and monsters. And let me know how I can improve your shelf. <laughs>